Hi, it's Barry Neal again here. In this video, we're going to cover something that's going to be really topical. It's going to be really popular over the next few months, and that is needle phobias. As they roll out the vaccines over the next few months, there are going to be people out there who are going to want to have a vaccination, but have either have a full-blown phobia of needles or at least have a huge anxiety about having a vaccination. So we need to be able to help these people. And there is a number of ways we can do that. I'm going to show you three ways in which you can help someone with a needle phobia. Now, first of all, big, big proviso, big warning. Some people, when they have, um, when they think about having an injection or when they have an injection, they will pass out. What happens with these people, their phobia is so extreme that what happens is their blood pressure drops and they pass out. Now it's really, really important that you know this. And you, first of all, you know about it when you're working with your client because you need to check to make sure uh, what happens to them when they think about having uh, an injection. So that's gonna be one of your first questions when they phone up or when they contact you on the internet, you wanna ask them. So tell me what happens when you think about um, having an injection or when the last time you went, what happened? If they say they passed out, they were out cold, then you need to be really, really careful. If they just say, oh, I was terrified, I didn't wanna do it or whatever, or I had to have a drink or whatever, not a problem, that's, that's really easy. The other one is relatively easy, but you have to have this proviso. And what you need to do is when you're working with the client to make sure they don't pass out when they're with you, because for, for some of them, just thinking about having an injection will be enough to have them pass out. So what you need to do is exactly the same thing. If you've ever um, given blood, what they ask you to do whilst you're giving blood to keep your blood pressure up so that you don't pass out is to tense and release your hands and tense your feet, your calves and your buttocks. And what that does is it keeps the blood pressure up. So when you start working with the person, when you start talking to them, you need to explain to them this first and you want them to tense their feet and their buttocks up and their calf muscles and their arms and just sort of rhythmically pump like this when you do what you do. Now, some of the techniques are going to involve doing certain things and you have to work around that, but you want to keep their blood pressure up. So some of the techniques, we're gonna ask them actually to use their hands. So in that case, in that situation, they're gonna to need to be squeezing their thigh muscles and their buttocks and their feet because you don't want someone passing out when you're working with them. And it's also within a good technique for you to teach them so that when they actually do go and give blood, that they're not going to hit the deck then as well. So first of all, once we've got that out of the way, we then want to elicit the triggers. We want to find out exactly when and where they get it. What, and what is it they're doing in their mind? This is a step that's so often missed out um, when people work with various different problems. They just hear whatever the problem is, whatever the presenting problem is, and then jump straight in. That's a big mistake. You need to elicit how the person does the problem and when and where it happens. So we first of all need to do some elicitation. So first thing is we need to be able to elicit when and where the state happens. So step one, when and where. So we always want to ask them, so when and where does this happen? And get them starting to associate. Now, if you've followed any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm pretty big on this thing called the meta pattern of NLP, which is the underlying pattern of all the patterns in NLP. And the first step in the meta pattern is to associate the client to the problem. So we need to know when and where does this happen. And then we, they go, well, okay, well, it's... Um, you know, a hospital or a doctor surgery or somewhere like this. Okay, great. Just walk me through this. Tell me what happens. So the first question is going to be, just walk me through this. So just walk me through this. Start telling me. And you want them to be telling you 
as if they are there. So you want to listen to the words that they're using. Are they associated or are they talking about as, oh, when I was in that, no, I'm in this situation, I'm walking in the doctor's office, that's what you want. So you want to get them using their language that is associating them. Okay, and so as you do X, as you are walking in through the doctor's office, as you whatever X, what happens next? So what we're looking for, what we need to be paying attention to are what is they're doing in the head? Because you'll start to get descriptions about what it is they're doing. They may say something like, oh, I, I, I just got this thought in my head of the, like the needle and I can't get it out of my head. And that's perfect. We know then what we're dealing with then is a submodality, an internal representation of um, a visual submodality that's right up close in their face. That is key information and that will tell us what we need to do. Another way of eliciting is, again, put them in the situation as you are, whatever it is, what happens next? And we want to slow what's happening. We want to slow this process down. We don't want it to rush through this. We want to find out how they're doing the problem. How are they creating this fear in their mind? Do they have an image that's really close? What is it they're doing? And this is how we do it. We are using um, questions from the meta model to slow down the process and get the key information. We need to be paying attention to their eye patterns. If they're going up to um, visual remembered, but they're remembering a time like in the past where this thing happened, or maybe they're visually constructing something and thinking about all the worst case scenarios. We need to have this information. So another question we could ask them is, when you think about X, either then what flashes through your mind, or and then another one, what's running through your mind? So we want to really listen to the, these, the answers they give. What's running through your mind? And if you see their eyes going up um, and they're like going like this and they're going, oh God, I was just thinking about all the last times that this happened and like, I've got this big image up here and it's like, oh, I just remember passing out or whatever it is, this is what we need to be working with. We need to elicit this information. And this doesn't just apply for working with needle phobias. This works with pretty much anything that you ever work with. You need to get this information. It, so, so often I see people um, who just hear the name of the problem like anxiety or a phobia or whatever it is and they just jump straight in. They haven't got this process because what we need to do, and this is what separates the highly skilled therapist from the average therapist, is you have to find the synesthesia. Now, some of you are saying, what the hell is a synesthesia? Well, in an NLP context, the synesthesia is what they is either typically a VK or an AK. So the senses are linked together. It's a VK synesthesia or an AK synesthesia. And by, what that means is they, they see something, instantly feel bad. There's not, they're not stopping to think about it, um, to analyze, oh, should I really be panicking? No, the two senses are linked together and creates an instant response. And this is what we need to find. We need to find the exact moment when this, whatever it is, in this case, um, a phobia, triggers, because that's the point where we need to make the intervention. If you just do like a shotgun approach and hope it works, then it may or not, may not work. But we wanna go in with this precision of a surgeon and we wanna get in there and find out exactly what is happening. What are they doing inside their head? Are they making pictures? Are they making a, a visually constructed picture? Are they making a visually remembered picture? Um, are they saying something for themselves? Are they hearing something? We need to know exactly what it is that triggers it. And we do this by slowing down the process and answering, asking them the questions. 
when does this happen? When and where does this happen? And then as you're in that situation, what's happening? When you think about that, what flashes through your mind? What's running through your mind? That gives us the information that we need. The other question that we can use, again, straight out of the meta model, how do you know you still have this problem? How do you know you still have this problem? And then maybe um, their eyes go blink and they, you, there's this visually remembered image up there. They can recall the last time and straight away, boom, they feel bad. So that is another good bit of information that we need to have. So now we've got that information, we find out how they're doing it. They're making some image in their head. Then uh, typically uh, from an NLP perspective, one of the things you want to do is to start working with those submodalities. So technique number one, which you can use to work with people with um, needle phobias is to start working with that image. So we're going to work with the submodalities. And typically it's going to be, we're going to be working with the visual submodalities in most cases. Sometimes it can be auditory, but for the most time we're working with visual submodalities. And the people, person will normally say, you ask the question, so what's running through your mind? And you go, oh, I just remember the last time this happened and I can see this big image right close to me. So we know from that sort of elicitation that they've got an image in their head that's very close to them. Now, there's some generalizations. For those of you who have not had a lot of training with NLP, there are some key submodality distinctions that make a huge amount of difference to how someone feels, particularly with the visual um, representational system. And as a generalization, if something is really, really close, it's more intense because a more intense feeling. If it's far away, then it's less intense. If it's color, then it's probably more intense than if it's in black and white. If it's big, it's probably more intense than it would be if it was small. Certain location, if it was over here to over there, that can make a key difference. And lightness, um, to darkness can make a big difference. So here's what we can do. What we can do is say, they've got this image in your head, and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, is this image, is it clear or is it color? Is it, is it black and white? We're asking them these questions. Is it, um, is it on the left or is it on the right? Point to where you see it, or well, it's right here. So we've got this big image right here. So great, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, first of all, we should drain the color out of that. So it becomes black and white. As it becomes black and white, I want you to notice how that changes the feeling. Now that's a key question. It's got, um, it's got presupposition in it that they are to notice that it changes the feeling. It's not, it's not like change it to black and white, does that change the feeling? Because the answer to that is either yes or no. But if you say, notice how that changes the feeling, that's what's called a presupposition of awareness. It's not a question of whether or not it changes the feeling. It's only a question of whether they've noticed it. And if they say, well, no, I don't notice that. I say, well, can you notice that? Oh, yeah. So and what we're doing here, there's a purpose behind doing this. We're doing a series of interventions. We're not using just one technique. We're using a series of interventions and getting feedback. So we're doing something, getting feedback doing something else, getting some feedback. So we're beginning to set feedback loops so that we know that they're changing, but also they have an experience that lets them know they're changing. And because of what we know about memory consolidation, if they begin to do this, they begin to change the way they think about it and then feel that change, then that change will get re-encoded into the brain so that in future, when they think about it, it will be different. So first of all, we've taken that image, we make it black and white. Then we say, great, okay, notice how that changes how you feel. Notice how that changes the feeling. Yep, great. Okay, now what I want you to do, I want you to push that image way off into the distance. So it's way over the other side of the room, maybe even further, maybe like a hundred yards away, the other side of, say, a football pitch. Make it really, really far away. And as you do that, give them time to do that, and you should be able to see the visual defocusing in their eyes as they, they send that off into the distance. Go, great. Okay, now notice how that changes how you feel. Yeah, great. Again, we've set up this feedback loop. 
Right now, what I want you to do, I want you to shrink it down really, really small so it's like the size of a tiny little dot. That's it, as small and as tiny little dot. And then what I want you to do, I want you to turn the brightness up and just white it out so it's completely whites out, completely whites it out. And as you do that, notice how that changes how you feel. Yeah, great. So that's step one. Now, for a lot of times, that may be all you need to do. If someone hasn't got a full blow phone phobia, they've just got a general anxiety, that may be enough. But let's not leave it there. Let's work a little bit further. Because then we want to go, step B, that's A, is we want to go and play with their internal dialogue. A lot of times anxiety and fears, particularly because a lot of the, folk, the, the people you're getting with um, needle phobias, they're not going to have full blown phobias. They're going to be having some form of anticipatory fear. And a lot of that is then driven by their internal dialogue. So we want to know when they think about having an injection, what are they saying to themselves? Oh my God, it's going to be terrible. It's going to hurt. Oh my God, it's going to be horrible. Oh my God, whatever. Write that stuff down. So let's say they say, Oh my God, it's going to hurt. Right? But it could be anything. Write it down. And then what we're going to do, and I, I credit um, an, uh, someone called Nick Kemp for this uh, technique, and it's, called, it's about slowing down the internal dialogue. Because what happens is, it, the internal dialogue, the rate and speed in which they say it, is linked to the level of intensity. If you listen to someone who's anxious, does someone who's anxious speak in a low, soft, relaxed, deep voice? No, that's not how you create anxiety. The only way you can create anxiety is by being anxious and talking really quickly and being overexcited and then your voice goes, ah. And your left hemisphere is going 99 miles an hour because you're talking so quickly. If you slow down the, the rate and speed in which you say whatever it is, then that changes the intensity of the feeling. So you don't necessarily need to be changing what they say, just changing how they say it. So you say to them, okay, here's what I want you to do. So that phrase, oh my God, it's going to hurt. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I'm going to say that word, say that phrase, and I want you to say it in your own head as you hear me say it. And I want you to say it in the same weight and speed that I say that. Got it? Yeah, okay. Here we go. Oh. My. God. Notice, as you say it at that speed, how that changes the feeling. So again, we are set another feedback loop. And now we're going to repeat this several times. And I want you to really get them to stretch it out, really exaggerate it. I won't do it on the video here because it will take all day, but I want you to really have them slow it right down. And sometimes what you can do is you could have them, you can add um, overlap and you add a visual component into it. So maybe you could have them see those words written on several billboards on buildings around them. So they're introducing a, a visual component to it as well. And again, every time you do that, notice how that changes how you feel. Notice how that changes the feeling. Can you notice that? So again, we're getting these feedback loops. Then, for the last bit, and again, that might be enough for, for many people. Just doing this, a lot of times with people with um, anticipatory anxiety, is really, really useful. It, it, it completely changes a lot of anxiety. But 
let's throw the kitchen sink at this. So, C, we're going to use the reverse spin from Richard Bandler, um, originally from his training neuro hypnotic reprogramming. And what you do, I mean, there's a number of variations of this. It really depends on what your preferences are. But basically, so you say to them, okay, so as you feel this, this uh, fear, where does it start? Where do you feel this feeling start in your body? And let's say they say it starts in my stomach. Now, two variations. You can say, okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to, variation one, you say, okay, I want you to feel that feeling and notice which way is it spinning? Is it spinning clockwise or is it spinning anti-clockwise? And for some people, you might need to get them to move their hands one way or another to check which way that it's going. And let's say they say, oh, it's spinning clockwise. And you say, great, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine bringing that feeling out so it's in front of you and then flipping it over. And I want you to spin it in the opposite way. I spin it faster and faster in the opposite way. Spin it anti-clockwise, faster and faster and faster in the opposite way. And notice as you spin it faster and faster in the other way, that old feeling begins to dissipate. It begins to reduce and suddenly you feel good. And it kind of becomes a little bit silly because it gets funnier and funnier and you maybe even start laughing about it. And maybe what would it be like if you do around like your favorite color to that feeling and you spin it round and round and kind of gets faster and faster. Maybe also add some sprinkles and things like that, some sparkles and see that spinning around in that way. And as that feeling gets re completely reduced, and suddenly you're feeling much, much better. It feels really, really good. Just bring that feeling inside of you and spin it in anti-clockwise. And as you do, you might be surprised how funny it seems to do that. And as you feel this feeling, I want you to think about, think about now going ahead and having that injection and notice how much calmer and more relaxed you are now. Keep spinning that faster and faster. Keep spinning it faster and faster and try, try hard in vain to bring back that negative feeling. Is it there? Has it gone? Come on, you used to be good about this. Spin it faster and faster, faster and faster. That's right, faster and faster. And again, notice how that changes how you feel. Think about trying to try and get the feeling back. Is it there? Has it gone? And then we want to mentally have them go back to that trigger. So when we, right at the front, when we elicited the trigger, you know, when and where do they have it? Have them go back to that. So we now work with the visual sum modalities. We've now worked with the internal dialogue. Now we work with the feeling. And then we take them back to the context, to the trigger. So now imagine yourself going back into that doctor's office and you walk in and you feel this spinning, spinning faster and faster and faster. And you feel this good Wonderful way, I want you to try, try hard in vain to bring back that negative feeling. Is it there or has it gone? Go on, really try, you used to be good at this. How do you try, the more calm, relaxed and in control you become. So that's one way of doing the reverse spin. The other way of doing the reverse spin is again, you ask them, so um, as you feel this anxiety, where do you feel it in your body? Oh, I feel it in my stomach. Okay, where does it spread to? Well, it goes up my chest, up to my throat. Okay, so it goes from your chair, so from your stomach, up your chest to your throat. Yep. Do you notice that implies a kind of path that goes up there? Yeah. Okay, I want you to just check, and I want you to notice which way does the feeling spin when it goes up that pathway? Does it spin clockwise or does it spin anti-clockwise? Oh, it spins clockwise. Well, wait, here's what we need to do. I want you to mentally flip that round so now it's spinning anti-clockwise. And notice as you do, that feeling reduces and you start feeling good. It's finding this new way. And what would it be like if you were to add your favorite color in that? A color that's like really good for you, maybe a healing color. What would it do if you, what would it feel like if suddenly you were spinning that way? Maybe you added some sparkles, that's right. And really spin it in the opposite way. And as you do, notice how calm and relaxed you become. That's it, notice how calm, relaxed you become. And as you feel this calm, relaxed feeling, just go ahead and think about now going into the doctor's office, whatever it is. And then we're collapsing the anger. We, so we again, we've, what we're doing here, we've worked with the key submodalities, we've changed those, we've worked with the internal dialogue, and now we've changed the kinesthetic. And for 99% of the people that you work with, that will be it but I want you to then test it. Don't just assume that just because you've been through the process that everything is gone. Test it, test it at every step of the way. Test the submodalities. Can, or do they notice how that changes how they feel? When they do the internal dialogue, can they notice 
how that changes how they feel. Then when you do the, the last spin, the, the reverse spin, put them back into the context which you elicited up front and make sure they can't do it. And then you need to future pace it. So what we've done here all the way through is following the meta pattern. We've associated them to the problem. Then we dissociate them from the problem. How do we dissociate them from the problem? Oh, push the image off right the other side of the room. That's dissociation, right? When we're working with the um, internal dialogue, if we have them see that on a billboard, that's dissociation. And when we're working with the reverse spin, if we pull that out and have that in front of them, that's dissociation. Then we associate them to the resources. They start feeling better. Then we then take those resources to the trigger and then we associate those resources to the problem context. If we do all those things, the problem's gone. So this is a really powerful set of maneuvers that you can use with any one of these clients who's, who comes in over the next few months who's gonna be suffering with a needle phobia. This is a perfect opportunity for you to get some free publicity in your local papers, maybe on the local radio station. You could, if you wanted to, you're feeling a bit generous, say that you will work with anybody, say over the age of 70, um, with a needle phobia for free. Get some publicity. Great way to get brand awareness and name awareness. So get practicing this with this. It is a fantastic way of working. I'm not gonna call it a technique because it's not a technique. It's a series of maneuvers that you can use to absolutely blow out any type of fear of needles. And if you follow the process, you can do this with many, many, many other things as well. So it's not just for a fear of needles. It works with so many different things. So there you go, fantastic way of working. Really changes the way the person thinks, reduces or eliminates the fear very, very quickly. This is typically done with one session. And for those of you who might be thinking, hang on a minute, um, am I supposed to hypnotize them first? No, 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 no. You don't need to do hypnosis. You're just working with their imagination. And that's all you need. So everything is done conversationally. And it's, it's such a powerful, powerful way of working. So have some fun with it. Make sure you go out and help some of these people because there's going to be some people over the next few months who are going to be really desperate. But, you know, they, they probably they spent the last year or so being terrified by, uh, by COVID. Now there is a solution with the vaccine coming up and they're terrified of the vaccine and they got themselves in a bit, of a bit of a vine. You can help these people. So go out there and get the work done. Help these people and help them get vaccinated. I'll speak to you soon.